I'm Dr. Scott Shaw and welcome to this week's Medical Minute. This week we're going to talk about respiratory distress in the dog. Respiratory distress is possibly one of the scariest emergencies, even for experienced emergency clinicians. And so I'm going to take a few minutes here and just talk about a general approach and some easy thoughts and tips and tricks to help deal with this scary and stressful emergency situation. The real goal when initially evaluating a patient with respiratory distress is to figure out what's going on as quickly as possible with the minimal amount of stress to the patient and to the staff. Really, there's sort of three big broad areas when I think about respiratory distress in the dog. Do they have upper airway disease, pulmonary disease, or pleural space disease? The vast, vast majority of cases that present with respiratory distress will have pathology in one of these three areas. And by looking at each of these three areas individually, we'll be able to come up with some tips and tricks for identifying them. As a general rule, the upper airway dogs are the easiest ones to identify. They come in with that very characteristic upper airway strider, um, breathing hard on inspiration. And so just a lot of times you can tell a dog with laryngeal paralysis without even getting up from your desk, just hearing how they're breathing. So upper airway sounds tend to be pretty easy to figure out as compared to lower airway sounds, which can be much more difficult to differentiate the cause. When you have a dog with respiratory distress that's not upper airway, the challenge then becomes to figure out, is it pulmonary or is it plural? Certainly the use of ultrasound can be a very helpful tool here, as can x-rays, but a lot of times just watching a patient breathe is enough. An animal with plural space disease will tend to have a lower um, respiratory rate and have a paradoxical abdominal motion where their abdomen is actually sucked up into their, uh, into their chest while they're, while they're inhaling versus an animal with pulmonary causes of respiratory distress will tend to have a faster heart rate and its abdomen will move in concert with its thoracic cavity. Well, once you get an idea of, I think it's upper airway, I think that it is, um, that it is the lungs, or I think it is the portal space, you then have to figure out what the exact problem is. By far, most commonly in dogs, um, laryngeal paralysis is, upper, is the most common upper airway disease, but we certainly see animals with tumors and or abscesses of the upper airways. It's important to remember when doing an upper airway exam that you should be well prepared to intubate a patient, because some of those patients, once, into, once sedated, aren't able to maintain their airway any, any longer. So being prepared is very important when performing an upper airway exam. If you think the problem is in the, is, is in the lungs, I usually make a decision on how to initially treat them based upon my auscultation. If they have severe respiratory distress and I can't get an x-ray, just based on auscultation, I'll decide whether I think they have heart disease or not. If they have a murmur or a gallop, I'll treat them for heart disease initially. And if they don't, I'll think it's more likely that they might have pneumonia or another form of respiratory disease. So it, I frequently will treat them for heart disease without that initial x-ray, and then once they're more stable, get an x-ray to confirm that diagnosis. Remember that if you have dogs with severe respiratory distress and you take their x-rays and the x-rays don't look like that, don't look nearly as bad as you think they should, a lot of times those dogs end up having a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. They'll have mild to moderate x-ray changes but severe respiratory distress. Mild pulmonary hypertension is sort of the great impersonator of, um, of, uh, car of respiratory disease in the dog world. If you see pleural disease, it's important to then figure out what's causing it. Really, you have three choices, fluid, blood, or pus. And the easiest way to figure that out is with a thoracocentesis. We'll do a future medical minute on actually performing a thoracocentesis and why nobody should be afraid to perform the safe and potentially life-saving procedure. So just to review quickly, watch the patient breathe, make some initial assessments and treatments if they just can't be out of oxygen, and then get yourself a set of x-rays, which should help you in diagnosing exactly what's going on um, and give you some initial treatment directions. And don't forget that patients with mild x-ray changes but severe respiratory distress frequently have pulmonary hypertension. For our next medical minute, we'll spend some time talking about cats, since they do vary a little bit from dogs in terms of their causes of diseases and how we're treating them. We look forward to hear, hearing any feedback you might have, and don't forget to send us your ideas for medical minutes. Thank you very much, and have a great week.